Lighthouse Scientific Education presents a lecture in the Electrochemistry series. The topic, Electrochemistry. Material in this lecture relies on an understanding of the previous lectures, redox, oxidation numbers and half reactions, redox, balancing equations, and net ionic equations. To familiarize ourselves with common terminology, a brief review of the redox reaction is offered. Then, an introduction to voltaic or galvanic cells that leads to a discussion of cell potential. Within that topic is the half cell, in which energy values can be looked up in a table. Then a look at calculating total standard cell potential. No discussion of electrochemistry would be complete without the battery, corrosion, and electrolysis. For those students who will need it, the advanced concept of the Nernst equation is outlined. Redox is short for reduction, oxidation. Oxidation reduction is reaction type 5 as covered in the types of reaction lecture. Some redox reactions also fall under synthesis and single displacement reactions. Reduction refers to the gain of an electron or electrons. Oxidation refers to the loss of an electron or electrons. A helpful anacronym for keeping the connection between oxidation reduction and loss gain straight is oil rig. It is the first letter of each word in oxidation is lose and reduction is gain. It makes the study of electrochemistry much easier if these terms are kept straight. A reducing agent is a chemical that causes reduction in another substance. It is oxidized itself. An oxidizing agent is a chemical that causes oxidation in another substance. Our first new topic is the voltaic or galvanic cell. In essence, it is a directed redox reaction. Redox reactions release energy that can be used to produce electrical current. The current is used to do work. A voltaic cell is a device that produces an electrical current from a redox reaction. It does this by splitting a redox reaction into two separate half reactions. These are called half cells and are physically separated from each other. There is an oxidation half cell and a reduction half cell. The most common voltaic cell is the galvanic cell. We will limit the discussion of voltaic cells to galvanic cells. Since the half reactions are separated from each other, electrons generated in the redox reaction are transferred through a connecting wire. With a redox reaction in a single container, no half cells, the electrons would directly transfer between reactants. So the separation of half cells is what makes a redox reaction a voltaic cell. A diagram will probably help clarify the matter. Consider the redox reaction zinc metal plus copper sulfate react to form zinc sulfate and solid copper. A galvanic cell of this reaction might look like this. It has two separate containers, two half cells. Each half cell contains a half reaction. To help simplify the reaction, it has been written out in its ionic form. The sulfate salts are soluble in water and dissociate into ions. The sulfate is a spectator ion and can be removed. A net ionic equation emerges that more clearly shows the relevant reaction. The reduction component of the reaction is the copper ion of the copper sulfate salt gaining two electrons to form the solid. The two electrons come from balancing the half reaction, as discussed in the earlier electrochemistry lectures. The oxidation component is the zinc solid losing two electrons and forming the zinc ion. These half reactions describe the chemistry of the half cells and are the basis of the general construction of the galvanic cell. The galvanic cell consists of electrodes, which are connected by a wire. Electric current flows between the electrodes as part of a circuit. A full circuit is like a circle, 
in that the flow of charge ends where it starts. Break the circuit and stop the flow. As for electrodes, in this galvanic cell, the zinc solid of the oxidation half reaction is an electrode. The copper solid of the reduction half reaction is an electrode. A wire connects the electrodes and allows the electrons that are released in the oxidation half reaction to get to the reduction half reaction. Once again, and from the perspective of the equations of the half reaction, electrons that are released in the oxidation half reaction travel along the circuit to get to the reduction half reaction. The flow of electrons can be measured by a voltmeter, or the energy of the transfer can be used to power a device like a light bulb. Also, as seen in the half reaction equations, there needs to be more in the half reaction than just the solids. The ions of the reaction need to be present in their respective half cells. Often the ions are found as electrolytes, ions dissolved in water. Electrolytes are solutions capable of carrying an electric charge. Electrolytes are also part of the circuit. The half cell containing the oxidation needs a solution of dissociated zinc sulfate salt. The solid zinc and the ionic zinc have to be present together. The half cell containing the reduction reaction needs a solution of dissociated copper sulfate salt. Again, the half cell needs to contain all species in the half reaction. The solid copper and ionic copper have to be present together. Also, the circuit needs to be completed, and the charges need to be balanced. There are electrons flowing between the electrodes, and a connector called a salt bridge allows the migration of ions between the half cells. A salt bridge is usually constructed of some damp, porous material that facilitates the movement of ions. A salt bridge works something like this. If negatively charged electrons are being moved from the zinc electrode to the copper electrode, then the zinc half cell will have lost negative charge, resulting in a more positively charged half cell. To prevent the buildup of positive charge, the salt bridge allows negatively charged anions to flow into the zinc half cell. It also allows the flow of positively charged cations out of the half cell which also helps to alleviate the buildup of positive charge. Continuing on the general construction, oxidation occurs at the anode. In this reaction, that is the zinc half reaction. The term electrode can be replaced with the term anode. As a source of electrons, the anode is considered as negative. Reduction occurs at the cathode. That's the copper half reaction. That electrode term can be replaced with the term cathode. As the attractor of electrons, the cathode is considered as positive. There's a possible conflict with the designation of positive and negative with anode and cathode. The assignment shown here is correct when the electrons are generated from a reaction inside a galvanic cell. But if the electrical source is from the outside, the assignments are opposite. Just another example of where positive and negative can trip us up. Let's apply the half reactions shown here and develop a fuller understanding of the galvanic cell. The solid zinc is the electrode of the half cell. A zinc atom loses two electrons and goes off into solution as a plus two ion. Those electrons are pushed along the wire by a potential. The potential is based on the desire for the electrons between the anode and the cathode, and is a subject that will be covered shortly. When the electrons get to the voltmeter, that potential can be measured, or the wire can be attached to some device to do work. Producing light is work. Now the electrons are not used by the light bulb. The potential, or some of the electron's energy, is. More on that soon. 
the electrons still need to continue their path to the cathode because they are on a circuit, and to break the circuit is to eliminate the potential. At the cathode, the copper ions in the solution pick up two electrons from the electrode and become copper atoms. Those atoms will become part of the cathode. Any charge buildup will be taken care of by the migration of ions across the salt bridge. Returning to the concept of a circuit, to prevent a buildup of charge, there needs to be a continuous flow of charge into and out of the electrodes. Sometimes that flow is electrons, and sometimes it is ions. A stoppage at any point along the circuit stops the whole circuit. Electrons do not flow in a stop circuit. The redox reaction will not proceed. Not all galvanic cells have the same capacity to push electrons along the circuit. That is where cell potential comes in. There is an energy potential between the electrodes in a galvanic cell, that is, for a spontaneous reaction. We are familiar with the term potential when dealing with gravity. A ball suspended above some surface has potential energy due to gravity. That potential energy is converted into kinetic or motion energy when the ball is released. In a galvanic cell, the energy potential is the driving force that allows electrons to flow along the circuit. Electrical potential and the gravitational potential are examples of forces that we can only detect by their action on objects or particles. In the galvanic cell, the electrical potential is called the cell potential, or E cell for short. It is also called the electromotive force, or EMF. Either term can be used. In a practical sense, E cell is measured in volts. It is called the cell voltage. The volt is a new unit for us, and it is defined as the unit for potential energy per unit charge. A deeper explanation of volts and electric fields is found in the study of physics. For us, volt is potential. A larger voltage is analogous to having an object suspended higher above the ground, larger potential energy. And we are familiar with our batteries having different voltages based on the work needed to power a device. Potential is not an easy concept to picture, so giving potential some numbers will help give it some context. A galvanic cell has a positive E cell if the reaction is spontaneous or favorable. Non-spontaneous or unfavorable reactions have a negative E cell. The introductory stage of the discussion of E cells is usually limited to the standard cell potential, E superscript O subscript cell or EO cell. It is the E cell under standard conditions, that's 25 degrees Celsius, 1.0 atmosphere pressure, and aqueous concentrations of one molar. With these conditional limitations, we can directly compare the potential of different reactions. But how do we find a potential for a reaction or half reaction? One way is to measure it. Another way is to look it up in a table. EO cell potentials for half cells or half reactions are listed in a lookup table in the back of most chemistry textbooks. For convenience, all half reactions in the table are written in the reduction direction. Each half reaction has electrons as reactants. That is not true for the half reactions that are usually found as oxidation half reactions. Is that going to be a problem? Not really. Once we understand how the table relates the half reaction, and the voltage. The hydrogen half cell potential is the reference point. It is given a value of zero. All other half cell reactions are compared to the hydrogen reaction. There are those that have a potential energy greater than the hydrogen's half cell. These have positive EO cell potentials and are considered favorable or spontaneous half reactions when written as reduction. 
they are usually listed the greatest EO cell potential at the top. That's fluorine going to fluoride on this table. On the other hand, half cell reactions that have a potential less than the hydrogen half cell will have a negative EO cell potential and are considered unfavorable or non spontaneous when written in the reduction direction. If all of electrochemistry was reduction, then this table would work as shown. But if there is reduction, there is oxidation. So, does this table also work with oxidation? Consider the reduction half cell, zinc ion, plus two electrons, forming zinc solid. According to the table, it has an unfavorable potential of minus 0.76 volts. Since energy cannot be created or destroyed, writing this half cell as oxidation will give a similar potential, but with a positive value. Same half cell, written in different directions, switching reactants and products, with equivalent size potentials, but with an opposite sign. In moving from reduction half cell to oxidation half cell, flip the sign of the EO cell. This entire table could be written as oxidation half cell potentials by flipping the reactants for products and changing the sign of the potentials. A table like this one does not need to include oxidation potentials because they are readily obtained from the reduction potentials. Now, a redox reaction has two half reactions and a galvanic cell has two half cells. In considering the entire reaction or the entire potential, the total standard cell potential is the sum of the potential at each electrode, that is for both half reactions. Mathematically, EO cell is equal to the EO reduction plus the EO oxidation. Fortunately, these potentials are gotten from a table, similar to the one we just covered. And as we just saw, when dealing with the EO oxidation part, we will need to flip the sign of the half reaction as listed in the table. That leads to a very important question. When the reaction is not given in half reaction form, how do we determine which half cell is the EO reduction and which is the EO oxidation? That question is answered by getting the total EO cell for the reaction written with both half reactions taking a turn at being EO reduction. For a spontaneous reaction, the EO cell must have a positive value. If the EO reduction plus the EO oxidation gives a negative EO cell, then the assignment of oxidation and reduction is backwards. Since this is one of the main features of the study of electrochemistry, Let's approach this question in a more ordered manner. The process of getting the EO cell potential is a rather straightforward one. Once the student feels that they understand the foundation of the process, they can modify it to their liking. Begin by writing out, or be given, two half reactions from the balanced chemical equation. Do not worry about whether the choice of oxidation or reduction is correct. That will be settled in the end. The nice thing about getting the EO cell for a reaction is that it doesn't really require a balanced equation unless it's asked for. So if balancing isn't asked for, then move on to the next step. If it is asked for, refer to the redox balancing equation lecture for that procedure. Secondly, get the EO reduction for both half reactions. They should be in an accessible lookup table. Use these EO reductions to get EO oxidations for each half reaction. Flip the EO reductions as previously shown. Remember to change the sign on the potential. Step four is a brute force step. Write the reaction in both directions. In one direction, make the first half reaction be reduction, and in the other direction, make it be the oxidation. For each direction, sum the potential of the two half reactions together for the EO cell. 
the two directions will produce the same potential value, except one will be positive and one will be negative. Compare the EO cell from both directions. The galvanic cell runs in the positive EO cell direction. That is the correct redox direction with the correct assignment of oxidation and reduction. Let's put these rules to test with a couple of examples. And the first example will be the reaction used to demonstrate the galvanic cell. Copper metal donates a couple of electrons to the zinc ion. The first step is to get the half reaction. This process was covered in more detail with the redox reactions, but essentially it is just keeping the same element and ion together in one half reaction. The electrons have been included, but if the objective is to get an EO cell, then the balancing of atoms, charge, and electrons is not necessary. Assuming that we did not know which half reaction is reduction and which is oxidation, get the EO reduction potentials for both reactions. That involves a lookup table. We need reduction potentials for zinc and copper. Here's zinc. It has a negative potential. We will bring that out. And the copper? It's right here. It has a positive potential. Let's bring that out too, so that the table can be dismissed and the potentials grouped with their half cells. Step three is to flip the EO reductions to get EO oxidations for each half reaction. For the zinc half reaction, the zinc metal moves from product to reactant. The magnitude remains the same, but the charge is now positive. And the EO reduction from the copper is flipped. The copper ion moves from reactant to product, and the EO oxidation is negative where the EO reduction is positive. The important step is to write the reaction out in both directions to find a positive EO cell. That is, one direction between this redox pairing and one direction between this redox pairing. It doesn't matter which direction you start with. Our first equation uses the half reactions as currently written. The zinc half reaction, written as reduction, added to the copper half reaction, written as oxidation. To get the total EO cell, add the EO reduction to the EO oxidation. The reduction potential is minus 0 0.76, and the oxidation potential is minus 0 0.34. Adding these values together gives a total EO cell of minus 1.11 volts. A negative potential is an unfavorable reaction. Written in this direction, the reaction is non-spontaneous. Perhaps the other direction will be more fruitful. Again, starting with the zinc, but as oxidation rather than reduction. It is copper's turn to be reduction. The total EO cell is calculated in the same way. The reduction potential of plus 0 0.34 and oxidation potential of plus 0 0.76 are added together to give a total EO cell of positive 1.11 volts. That is a positive potential. As written, this reaction is favorable and has a driving potential of 1.11 volts. It is important to recognize that the EO cell from the two reactions have the same 1.11 volts, but with different signs. That is expected since the reactions have flips of the same potentials. Yet another example of the law of conservation of energy. A second example problem is coming up shortly. But while we have these opposite reactions, a deeper look at what the potential means from an energy perspective can be had. Starting with the favorable reaction. According to the equation, the zinc is giving up electrons to the copper ions. Electrons move from anode to cathode. The potential pushes them. Some of the potential can be removed 
from the reaction and be used for work. It is not the electrons that are being harnessed or removed. It is the energy of the electrons. The electrons themselves have to complete the circuit. This is an example of a battery, which is an upcoming topic. On the other hand, the unfavorable reaction has copper metal giving up electrons to zinc ion. That has electrons moving from cathode to anode. This is moving against the potential. It's like lifting a ball versus letting it fall. The electrons have to be pushed to move in this direction. Energy has to be added to the reaction. Maybe a battery is hooked up to provide that energy. Pushing the reaction against the potential is called electrolysis and is a subject discussed later in the lecture. Now we will return to cell potentials with a second example. It is a metal, aluminum, reacting with an acid, sulfuric acid, to produce a salt, aluminum sulfate, and hydrogen gas. The reaction can be simplified to its net ionic form by removing the spectator ion, sulfate. With the sulfate gone, the equation is easier to follow. While getting an EO cell does not require a balanced equation, we can still employ what we know on this one. Note that the hydrogens are not balanced. That's easy remedied with a coefficient of 2 in front of the hydrogen ion. A typical question here is, is this reaction as written spontaneous? Another way of saying that in electrochemistry terms is, is a total EO cell positive? That's going to require us to get the total EO cell from this reaction going in the forward and reverse directions. The first step in the process is getting the half reactions. Reactants will stay reactants and products will stay products. The hydrogens will form one half reaction. While it is balanced in atoms, it is not balanced in charge. The reactant side has a plus two charge, and the product side is neutral. As discussed in the first redox lecture, the only way to balance charge is with the addition of negatively charged electrons. Two of them will give the reactants a neutral charge, just like the product. The other half reaction is the aluminums. It too has an unbalanced charge. Using the same argument, Three electrons are added to neutralize the charge on the product. Again, while not necessary to getting a total EO cell, we will address the discrepancy in the number of electrons in the two half reactions. In the redox balancing electrons lecture, it was shown that balancing electrons is done by multiplying one or more of the half reactions by a whole number. If the entire hydrogen half reaction is multiplied by a three, and the entire aluminum half reaction is multiplied by A2, the half reactions will both have six electrons. Yes, this is an advanced skill. The next step is to go find the EO cell potentials from the table. To save some time, the potentials have been gathered from the table. Hydrogen is the reference potential and given a neutral or zero potential. The reduction form of the aluminum half reaction has a negative potential of 1.66. Question, does this EO reduction value also have to be multiplied by three, like the half reaction? Does this one also need to be multiplied by two? They do not. The energy is left alone. As mentioned before, Changing coefficients to a whole number multiple does not change the reaction. Same reaction gets the same energy. These EO reduction values are used regardless of how the equation is balanced. With EO reduction in hand, it is only a matter of flipping the reaction to get EO oxidation. Flipping hydrogen has the hydrogen metal moving from product to reactant. The energy is still zero. Hydrogen is the reference EO reduction because EO reduction is equal to EO oxidation. 
we will not come across another half reaction like this. As for aluminum, the flip has the aluminum ion moving from product to reactant. There is a sign change. EO oxidation is a positive value. It's time to compare the EO cells for the two directions. One direction has this redox pairing, and the other direction has this redox pairing. The first direction will be with these half reactions. The hydrogen half reaction written as reduction and the aluminum half reaction written as oxidation. The total EO cell is the sum of the EO cell for the two half reactions. The table informs us that it is a zero for the reduction and plus 1.66 volts for the oxidation. This reaction has a positive potential plus 1.66 volts. As written, this is a favorable reaction. We have answered the original question. For completion's sake, we could look at the reverse reaction. The hydrogen is written as oxidation and the aluminum as reduction. The total EO cell is the oxidation voltage of the hydrogen and the reduction voltage of the aluminum. That will be a negative 1.66 volts, indicating that when written in this direction, the reaction is unfavorable and will need an external energy source to make it go. When approached in a stepwise manner, getting the total EO cell of a reaction is a process that quickly becomes more comfortable. The next topic is a more familiar one. It is batteries. A battery consists of two or more voltaic cells arranged in series to produce electrical energy. Often they are based on the galvanic cell. The definition says that there are at least two of these cells and that they are arranged in series. Here are three galvanic cells. In series means that there is a connection, a wire between the anode of one cell and the cathode of another cell. That happens between each set of neighboring cells. There is also a connection between the first cathode of the first and the anode of the last cell. In order to make the whole thing one giant circuit, the path of the charge goes between the cells and ends up back where it started. Some of the flow of charge is by electrons, and some by ions, by connecting the galvanic cells in series. It essentially allows the potential from each galvanic cell to be added together. More cells makes a stronger battery. Like a car battery, it has individual cells connected in series. The individual cells provide the potential, and when the positive and negative terminal are connected in series, that potential can be tapped to perform work, like turning the engine over and starting the car. There's some basic types of batteries. A primary battery cannot be recharged. Most of the hand batteries. batteries fall under this heading. They get used up, thrown away. A second battery is rechargeable. A car battery gets recharged during driving. Cell phones and computer batteries need to regularly be recharged through either a wall socket electricity or a computer, which itself is plugged into the wall. We will take a deeper look at each type, starting with the primary battery. The most common type of non-rechargeable battery is the alkaline battery. It is often called a dry cell battery because it lacks water. Like all batteries, it is driven by a redox reaction. The anode has the oxidation of zinc, while the cathode has a more complicated reduction reaction involving magnesium oxide and ammonia. Its construction goes something like this. In the center, there is a cathode. It is made of carbon, surrounded by magnesium oxide. Around these is a paste containing zinc ion and ammonia. Around this is the anode, solid zinc. 
the whole thing is surrounded by some type of non-conductive material so that the top and bottom of the battery control the flow of electrons. The battery is a circuit, so the number of electrons that flow out must flow in. Some of the energy potential or pushing power is taken off the electrons by whatever device is utilizing the battery. Batteries do not provide electrons. They provide energy from the electrons. Rechargeable batteries are no less involved. There are several popular types, and the exact chemistry can vary within a type. General reactions will be given, starting with the lead acid storage battery, the car battery. The anode is lead solid, and it is exposed to a sulfate acid solution. The cathode is lead 4 oxide, also exposed to an acid. Written this way, the half reactions generate a large potential. The oxidation at the anode has a potential of plus 0.36 volts. The reduction at the cathode has a very large 1.68 volts. Combined into a total EO cell, the battery per cell has a potential of about 2 volts. That is where the energy comes from. A typical car battery will have 6 galvanic cells connected in series. Add 6 of these voltages together gives a 12 volt car battery. Eventually, even a strong battery like this one will run down. To charge or recharge the battery, the reverse reaction must take place. Being the same reaction, written in reverse, means the potential is the same size, but opposite signs. In practice, the battery loses energy to heat, so these potentials are upper limits. And then, there is the nickel-cadmium rechargeable battery. These can be found with many battery-powered hand tools. The anode of the battery is made of cadmium metal, and the cathode is the more involved nickel oxide hydroxide. The last rechargeable battery that we will look at is the lithium battery. It is a more sophisticated battery with an industry push to make it even better. The overall chemistry is way beyond this level of study. This is currently a common reaction, but there are new batteries on the horizon, and they promise to be superior in performance and more complicated in their chemistry. The next topic is corrosion. Its definition is that it is a process that returns refined metals to a more stable form. A slightly more manageable definition is that corrosion changes the oxidation state of the metal. To tag corrosion to what we already know is through rusting. Rusting is a spontaneous or favorable reaction of metal, often iron, with the oxygen in the air. Water speeds up the process. Corrosion occurs with metals exposed to the air because metals generally have reduction potentials that are less positive than that of molecular oxygens. Calling back the potential table, it can be seen that iron's reduction potential is negative and oxygen's reduction potential is positive. A redox reaction with iron and oxygen will generate a positive total EO cell when the iron reaction is written as oxidation. Oxygen is an oxidizing agent because it causes iron to oxidize. The oxygen itself is reduced in the process. Corrosion is a problem because so much of the infrastructure in the world is made of the refined metals. There are ways to protect or limit the corrosion of metals. Limit the exposure to air, and therefore oxygen, and to water. A good thick coat of paint will often do the job. There are also chemical means for adding protection. The surface of a metal can be treated. Galvanizing, or the application of a coat of zinc metal, is a popular treatment. Zinc is far less susceptible to oxidation by oxygen than iron, so it makes a good barrier. Another type of surface treatment is anodization. It is said to be an electrochemical process 
that converts a metal surface into a decorative, durable, corrosion-resistant finish. Certain metals like aluminum lend themselves to this technique. And then there is alloying. An alloy is a mixture of metals. Alloying combines a corrosive metal with one or more less reductive metals. That yields a metallic mix that has a lower total potential and limits the corrosion. Steel is an excellent example. Corrosive prone iron is combined with less reductive chromium. Electrolysis is a topic introduced earlier in the lecture. Electrolysis, in the context of the galvanic cell, is pushing a spontaneous reaction to run in the non-spontaneous direction. It is running a reaction in reverse, and it consumes energy. Under these conditions, the electrons are pushed from the positive cathode to the negative anode. For demonstration purposes, we will bring back the galvanic cell, running in the spontaneous direction, positive EO cell, left to its own devices, the electrons move from the anode to the cathode. In electrolysis, that reaction is reversed. Products become reactants, and reactants become products. Electrolysis runs the reaction backwards, electrons moving from cathode to anode. And since the potential is negative, the reaction on its own should not occur, unless it is powered from the outside. This reaction consumes energy, and an applied voltage is necessary. Maybe the cell is connected to a battery, or is somehow connected to an electrical outlet. But how much energy is needed? For electrolysis to proceed, a voltage, energy, is applied that is greater than the potential of the spontaneous reaction. The spontaneous or favorable reaction had a potential of 1.11 volts. For electrolysis to proceed, an applied voltage exceeding 1.11 volts is required. In the end, the total voltage, the negative potential of the reverse reaction, and the applied voltage, the power source, must be a positive value. To say that again, for a reverse reaction to occur in electrolysis, the total standard cell potential is the EO reduction an EO oxidation of the reverse reaction, that is a negative potential, plus an applied voltage from an external source. The total potential of the process must be positive. That is the only way to make an unfavorable reaction occur. A reaction in one direction produces energy, and in the reverse direction, it consumes energy. So. When is electrolysis needed? With electroplating. One type of metal is applied to the surface of another type of metal. Electroplating is used in the production of pennies. Zinc-based pennies are coated with copper. Long gone are the days when pennies were made of all copper. Zinc is much cheaper than copper, but to keep the penny looking like a penny, a small coating of copper is added. Electrolysis is also central to refining ore, that is separating metal from rock that has been mined. Aluminum is dug from the ground in oxidized forms, such as aluminum oxide. Energy is added to the ore to reduce the aluminum to its refined metallic form. Same type of process is needed in mining copper. And then there is the electrolysis of sodium chloride. Salt water is pushed by a current to produce chlorine gas and the base sodium hydroxide. Both of these products have their own industrial applications. Our last example is cleaning. Dirt or tarnish can be removed from silver. Silver oxidizes in the air, tarnishes. Electrolysis reduces silver back to its metallic and more attractive form. There is another topic though, but it has advanced concepts in it. It is the relationship between potential and thermodynamics and equilibrium. Not all students will need a thorough understanding of those relationships. The total EO cell of a reaction K 
can be related to the free energy, delta G, of the reaction and the equilibrium constant K of the reaction. Both of those later quantities are representations of the energy of a reaction as discussed in the equilibrium lecture in the energy series. These three concepts are just different ways of looking at the energy of a redox reaction. The big new step is relating these quantities with work. The work that a galvanic cell can do and limiting the discussion to standard state conditions is equal to minus NF times the EO cell. Breaking that relationship down has N as the number of moles of electrons transferred in the reaction. That is the number of electrons that we have been crossing out when combining half reactions. F is called Faraday's constant. It is the charge on a mole of electrons. That happens to be 95,484.56 coulombs per mole. Minus NF times the EO cell is work from a potential perspective. We've also come across work with free energy. The two forms can be equated. Delta G at standard state equals minus NF times the EO cell. Thermodynamics meets electrochemistry. There's still more. In that equilibrium lecture, free energy is shown to be related to the equilibrium constant K. Delta GO equals negative RT, natural log of K. R is the gas constant. T is temperature in Kelvin. LN is shorthand for natural log. Perhaps you see where this is going. Both of these relationships have delta GO isolated on one side of the equation. That means they can be set equal to each other. The new combined equation has the work from the electrochemical potential related to the equilibrium constant of the reaction. The minus signs cancel out and are not shown. The name of this relationship is the Nernst equation. At standard state, specifically 25 degrees Celsius, the equation can be solved for EO cell, and the constants R and F can be combined to give a simplified expression that relates potential, number of electrons being transferred, and the equilibrium constant, K. This is as much of the topic that we are going to cover. If the students are at all expected to use the Nernst equation, it will probably be a matter of inserting given values and solving the math. And that completes the material of the lecture. As a recap, a voltaic cell is a device that produces an electrical current from a redox reaction. The most common type of voltaic cell is a galvanic cell. It physically splits a redox reaction into two separate half reactions. Since they are separated, they are called half cells. The galvanic cell that we covered has electrolyte solutions surrounding the electrodes and a salt bridge that connects the half cells so that ions can migrate and keep the charge balanced. The negatively charged anode is the electrode of the oxidation half cell. It loses electrons. The cathode is the electrode of the reduction half cell. It gains electrons. The cell potential, the E cell, or the electromotive force, EMF, is an energy potential between the electrodes. It is what pushes the electrons along the circuit and is the energy that can be harvested from a galvanic cell. Potential is measured in volts. It is called the cell voltage. Half cell potentials are listed in a table in the reductive forms. If the potential for the E cell is positive, the reaction is spontaneous or favorable. The reaction will occur on its own. If it is negative, it will require an outside energy source to force it to occur. The standard cell potential, EO cell, is where the conditions of the reaction meet standard state conditions. The total standard cell potential is the sum of the potential at each electrode. 
the total EO cell equals the EO reduction plus the EO oxidation. To get the total EO cell for reaction, write out or be given two half reactions from the balance equation. Then get the EO reduction for both half reactions. Use the table of potentials. Next, get an EO oxidation for each half reaction. That is done by flipping the EO reduction equation and changing the sign on the voltage. Compare the EO cell with the reduction reaction written in both directions. The reaction with a positive potential is a spontaneous reaction. A battery consists of two or more voltaic cells arranged in series to produce electrical energy. A primary battery cannot be recharged. Alkaline batteries of this kind. A secondary battery is rechargeable. We looked at lead acid, nickel cadmium, and lithium rechargeable batteries. Corrosion is a process that returns refined metals to a more stable form. Corrosion is a change in the oxidation state of a metal. Rusting is the most recognizable example. Rusting is a spontaneous reaction. Common ways of protecting a metal from corrosion include treating the surface of the metal and mixing the metal with other metals, alloying. Electrolysis runs the galvanic cell backwards. Electrons move from cathode to anode. To get a backward reaction to go, apply voltage greater than the potential of the spontaneous form of the reaction. Finally, the Nernst equation relates EO cell to delta G and K. It combines electrochemistry with thermodynamics and equilibrium. And that concludes the lecture. Much of chemistry is the movement of electrons.